Uh, hi, Professor Beverly. Uh, feel free to, <laughs> to join. Yes. I really would like to welcome all of you to the last, but certainly not the least, session of the second day of the, this absolutely fantastic conference. And we have three wonderful speakers uh, who will be talking about such things as how to keep people safe and uh, smart farms, and also about business performance management solutions and technology. So I think we have three wonderful speakers and our first speaker will be Mohammed Farouk. Uh, are you here? There you are. And I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor. So, you know, very good seeing you, all of you. So, you know, I think uh, we all are sitting in different parts of the world. So I don't know what to say. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are in the world. Yeah, for our so, midnight, yeah. it's midnight. <laughs> I know in Kuwait, I know it's Kuwait. It's, 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 it's quite a hectic, you know, it's a long day for you, doctor. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I would uh, straight away walk into the presentation considering the time. So, uh, so today I'm going to talk about, um, uh, you know, a soft capital innovation. So very much aligned with what Igo was talking about right now, but from a different perspective, because we all look at innovation, uh, you know, from different angles and different perspective, depending on the culture and the maturity, what we all have in, uh, you know, from different angles. So I'm based in the UK. So uh, my name is Mohammed Farooq. So I have started a company, you know, 11 years back uh, <clears throat> after failing in, after failing big time uh, in my first venture, which was a software company. And I thought I'll never make it again, but, you know, fortunately the second one worked well and, you know, like here I am. So, <clears throat> so uh, today, uh, you know, today uh, what we would be looking at is uh, similar to what we all thinking of, uh, how can we make innovation every, uh, available for everyone everywhere? So what is soft capital innovation? So this is something very simple. You know, during the pandemic, we were really thinking of, you know, how can we make the business better and bigger? So I would say, uh, you know, this is something which is a baby of uh, a pandemic. So we all had a lot of problems. We all had a lot of opportunities. So we have explored one of the opportunity and brought it into a successful solution. So which is currently practiced across the globe. It's recently started. So I'll talk a bit about that. So, uh, so when, I say, uh, when I say making innovation available for everyone everywhere, so uh, the purpose is to make sure that, uh, you know, we help to build successful organizations through innovation. So <clears throat> it doesn't have to be just an idea sharing. You know, we always see a lot of events. We always see uh, a lot of brainstorming and, you know, we always see a lot of incubation and innovation hubs. But uh, what happens to all those ideas, you know, when we get excited, you know, we always have a lot of ideas, right? So what happened, what happened to all those problems? You know, uh, you know, what do we really do with those? You know, most of them grows to the graveyards as everybody says, but, uh, you know, there are some exciting ways to explore those ideas. So let's look into that. So I thought I would introduce you, uh, inter introduce you all to something called design space. So this is a space where everybody uh, uh, can come in and, yeah, and talk about, uh, you know, talk about their innovation and talk huh? about their digital ideas, right? So, you know, it's called the soft capital innovation engine. So... <clears throat> Uh, yeah, so, you know, here, uh, you know, we all have, we all have plenty of, uh, we all have plenty of, okay, I'll mute Dr. Okay, I'll mute. Yes, please. Please unmute. I'm so sorry. Please mute. <laughs> yeah, so that's fine. So, uh, it's like this, you know, People every, everywhere around the world have got a lot of ideas. So, you know, uh, it's like this. People who've got a lot of money, they are, they are cash rich and time poor. People have got a lot of ideas only. They don't have technology access. They don't have money. So what we thought was, you know, we, would th we thought we would introduce something 
where anybody and everybody can come in and they can do a zero cost prototyping with us. So it's a very simple process, you know, so it's a collaborative innovation platform where every single participant of the innovation ecosystem can come in and join us. So we know that you know, innovation exists everywhere in the world. So our engine actually brings everybody together. So it's a very simple process. An idea holder comes with an idea, you know, an investor comes with money. And uh, you know, so what we do generally is that you know, we, we can help them in, in the process of providing them with the soft capital. When we say soft capital, it's all about people, process and technology together. So we've got a huge uh, software team, uh, you know, which is available, uh, which is available in our different offices. So this prototyping and testing will be, uh, you know, very much required for the current market. It is because uh, it is because uh, you know when we go for an event or when we go for uh, you know an in, an incubation hubs, you know the kind of bureaucracy or the kind of process involved in getting my idea qualified for funding, for processing, for prototyping, for loans and everything else, it's, it's quite stringent. So we thought we would just hear the idea. So I would explain you the process in a while. So this is open for a common man. This is open for an organization. This is open for a social organization. This is open for the government entities and everybody else, right? So, you know, like what I said, anybody and everybody can come in and explore this, uh, explore this, right? So let's see uh, who are the key stakeholders, you know? So uh, when we explore this idea, you know, so you would get to see, we generally partner with people, we generally partner with organization and uh, deploy this. I would explain a bit more when I go further. So before we go further, let me explain, uh, let me explain about the process. So what we do is that, you know, the first thing when somebody comes up with an idea, you know, we hear the idea, you know, we brainstorm the idea with them and we prepare a business case. And this business case would be put into a proper prototyping. And this steps one to four, you know, we don't charge any money. So this is just to make sure that, you know, innovation is accessible for everybody. And uh, we have this design space available as a virtual platform. And this virtual platform is uh, deployed in different parts of the world through our partners as well. So it could be through a university, it could be through a city council, it could be through a national government, or it could be through a regional government. So what happens is that you know, once the prototyping is done, we've got a series of, you know, we have got a series of uh, investors, you know, from different uh, local regions, and uh, we invite them to come and participate and hear the ideas. So these ideas are explored by them. And, you know, currently, you know, we are talking about, uh, we are talking about, you know, this is, the, as I said, this is kind of a new concept, you know, which we have started recently. We have, uh, we have uh, actually successfully launched 12 businesses so far within this practice, you know, after starting this. So, you know, it's so exciting to see somebody comes up with an idea with zero commitment. So after the prototyping, if they don't like it, they just walk away. You know, the idea belongs to them. We have got an NDA signed up with them. We have got all the contracts in place. So what happens is uh, simply they just carry their idea and, you know, they, they go away with it, right? And sometimes what happens is, you know, an idea which is not flying in Africa can be very successful in the Middle East, right? So an idea which is uh, very successful can also be deployed in other parts of the world, right? So what happens is that, you know, once, uh, you know, once we have the founders connected, we also build uh, the MVPs and further developments, uh, you know, with the idea holder, once we build the business model, and then we have a strategy and, you know, and the go-to-market strategy and launch and, you know, then help them to grow rich. So the process completely, it's a fluid process. It's not a standard process, depending on the opportunity and business model it would generally you know, vary from uh, you know, idea to idea, All right? So some of the, some of the benefits uh, of the process, you know, simply speaking, so uh, what you have here is that you know, you're looking at creating new products and services, you're looking at creating uh, you know, patents, you're looking at creating social and economic development, you know, you're looking at creating more jobs, you're looking at creating 
uh, you know, more internships. And, uh, you know, when an organization comes up with the challenges, they have got improved processes and, you know, they've got, uh, uh, you know, they've got better bottom lines and, you know, better profitability. And <clears throat> this is kind of a, you know, simple platform where people come in and, you know, they can submit their idea in three minutes. So in two minutes, so, you know, they can, they can explore it further once. Uh, so, <clears throat> And uh, these are some of the areas where you can explore. And uh, so it's, uh, you know, like while we do, do this, it is industry specific, it is functional specific, uh, it is, uh, you know, it could be organizational specific. And, you know, so it could be, uh, you know, it could be any area which is, which is relevant uh, for any organization. So what we generally do is that, you know, we don't implement this alone. We find partners in different parts of the world and uh, then we launch it, uh, then we launch it with the support. And uh, the most important thing is that, you know, as an organization, uh, you know, uh, or as an individual, when we build a digital idea, you know, they don't really own the intellectual property if it is, some, if it is built by somebody else. But what we do is that, you know, whoever comes up with an idea, the IP belongs to the idea holder, the IP belongs to the organization who is working it, uh, working with us. And uh, like what I said, it brings a lot of social and economic development, you know, throughout uh, throughout the process. Okay, and uh, I would also quickly take you through uh, the actual dashboard, which you can see when you submit an idea, and you know, like what are the benefits and development it is going to bring throughout the process. And uh, this is where it gets it is getting excited. So. Oh, we are looking at, uh, you know, we are looking at uh, creating 300 successful businesses in the next three years. The dream is not really big, but, uh, you know, what we are looking at is that, you know, to complete 500 prototypes. And when we say 500 prototypes, we don't ask many questions and, uh, you know, shortlisting criteria for, uh, for somebody comes up with an idea. We help, you, we help them to prototype the whole, you know, the whole concept. And uh, then we connect them to the innovation ecosystem. And uh, so, uh, as I said, you know, from 12 businesses launched, we are looking at having 300 businesses coming up in, in the next three years through this process across the world. So we cannot do this alone. We want support from every single one of you to come in and join us in terms of doing it. So it's, it's kind of a zero commitment process. Anybody can come and share their ideas. And uh, so who knows, you know, out of these 300 companies, like Igor said, you can see that, you know, the, 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 there, could be, uh, there could be 20 unicorns, there could be 30 unicorns, there would be 200 patents, you know. So there's no, uh, you know, so the only, only thing what we generally say is that when somebody comes up with an idea, it has to be a digital idea. It could be blockchain. It could be artificial intelligence. It could be a simple digitization. But you know, currently we are processing only digital idea. So hopefully, you know, we can achieve our goal together as a team. So it's uh, it's it's kind of uh, uh, it's kind of a very simple and easy process uh, where you can explore it in a detail. And so, you know, as, as you're hearing, uh, you know, you can, you know, so you can say, you can choose your design space. Like I said, it could be an industry, it could be a location, uh, it could be a national government. So it could be a design New York, it could be a design Africa, it could be a design London, or it could be design Dubai, or it could be design Kuwait. So it could be anywhere. So, you know, so basically, uh, you know, we've got the whole process, we've got the technology expertise, we've got the uh, you know, we've got a we've got a beautiful technology engine to the uh, engine to run the whole process. So all we look at is that you know how can we make it accessible and available for students, for working professionals, for unemployed, you know, for government entities, for social organizations, you know, and how can we collaborate with the universities? How can we collaborate the other ecosystem? You know, the other ecosystem key players in terms of. Uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, you know, uh, you know, the educational institutions, the national governments, the city, the city and state governments, right? So it's high time you choose your design space, and uh, you know, basically, like what I said, 
uh, you know, it is it is kind of a very powerful tool. You know, it could be uh, it could be an in, it could be an industry. It could be uh, you know a specific function. So uh, we are uh, we are currently uh, you know opening up in different parts of the world, and you know we have got uh, we've got a lot of exciting partners. So I'll I'll quickly uh, you know uh, I'll quickly take you through uh, the platform itself. So and uh, before I go there. Uh, please make a note of uh, my mobile number if you want to take a screenshot and uh, please take uh, take a note of my mobile number in case if you want to reach me. So before I wind up, you know, I would uh, quickly show you the platform itself so that you can see how design space community works if I have time. You have about three, three minutes. Perfect. That's more than enough. Yeah. So you can see the design space platform here. So you can see the number of ideas submitted. So it is, it is for a design space partner. This is just a sample data. So you can see the number of patents. You can see the number of technology projects. You know, a very simple dashboard. If this is executed at a national level, you don't need to submit any report. You know, the, the, the minister comes in and sees that, okay, what kind of social and economic development we are making for the country? Because we spend so much of time and energy and money for every country. And, you know, I don't know where those budgets are going on, but if you've got an exciting engine, you know that, okay, how many new startups have been created? What is the number of jobs? And you can see the number of ideas, you know, and the current status of each of those ideas. And there's a very powerful innovation community, like what I said, it could be, you know, it is, it is a global community. So it's a very powerful community. So when I was looking at the, uh, you know, the key speakers and, you know, the kind of roles they play, I thought that, you know, this is a very powerful platform where people can, uh, you know, come and explore it. And it's, a, you know, this is where the website is. When, uh, when you come to the website, so it's, a, it's called designspace.io, you can just click on it. All you have to do is that, you know, you have to spend those three minutes uh, to, you know, to submit your idea. So I'm not just, so it's like, uh, it's, it's, it could be anything. And you know, I'm not spending much time on it. It's, it's, it's a conversational data capturing tool. So, you know, so you want to keep your idea public or private, like Iger said, you want to keep it open, you can say, and or you want to keep it private, you can keep it. So it's, 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 it's a very simple process. Is it solving any problems? And, you know, and, uh, you know, finally, you can look at the opportunities and then you say that, okay, I just want to submit it. So that's the, that's the whole process. Right, so I would like to stop here, you know, you know, without uh, taking a lot of time. So hope if, if there is any, any, uh, anything to be discussed, we can use the rest of the time, uh, you know, if that's okay with you all, yeah. Because we hope to have a round table at the end with all three. Yeah. And I, I think this should be a very interesting round table discussion. Uh, next, we have uh, Martin Hogan, and Martin is the co-founder and CEO of Safe Citizens, and the whole idea is technology to keep people safe. So we'll see what Martin has to say. Welcome. Thank you, Professor Anderson, and good evening, everybody. My time, UK time, um, and and. Uh, Actually, I think we've got things slightly the wrong way around, oh. uh, Professor. Tomorrow I'm talking about the company that I founded. Oh. Tonight, tonight I was asked to just give some some kind of entrepreneurship 101s, if you like, for uh, for, for 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 people who uh, <laughs> who want to learn from an old grey man who uh, who is uh, who's rather long in the tooth, but very very experienced in terms of entrepreneurship. So. A little bit of background to myself, if if if, if you'll bear with me, um, I'm a lawyer and 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 a businessman by training, uh, and and I've spent most of my career working for big corporations uh, in the pharmaceutical arena, and I was in an executive director of Roche Pharmaceuticals uh, back in the day, and then I, I I guess I just got bored, and and with that I decided I'd. I'd 
I wanted with 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 a couple of people that I knew had worked with in the past and who I respected immensely to start a company. And this was in 2014. And and um, we we went through the process of what we thought uh, starting a company would look like. And we tripped up many times along the way. It, it, the company still exists. And we did successfully exit it at the back end of 2018. So it was successful. But there were very, very many hurdles along the way that we had to overcome. Um, and I thought that that uh, you know Dr. Hanandi asked me to to share some of those with you uh, ahead of me talking about the company itself tomorrow night. So so if you'll bear with me, um, I'd, I'd I'd like to just kind of do that. And the first thing that I think I'd like to tell any budding entrepreneur is is look for some way of validating your idea. Um, everybody's got ideas. Not everybody thinks they're they're as great as you think they are. Right. Um, and, and, and so you need to be very, very clear about what the value proposition is and, and what gaps in the marketplace or opportunities they're looking to exploit. Um, and, and make sure that every single person that you speak to goes away from that discussion absolutely with no confusion around what it is that you're looking to achieve. And I think that... that the other lesson is is don't go to your friends and family and ask them if it's a good idea. They'll be kind. They'll be really, really nice to you and tell you all the things you want to hear, but not necessarily be brutally honest. And and so seek out experience, seek out honesty. Um, otherwise, I'm afraid that that the time that you spend pitching the idea and and in front of VCs or 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 the like down the road is going to be a painful one. Um, so, so do try and get all of that out of the way before you. And then lastly, I would urge, you know, I heard a speaker earlier saying that, that, that youth is power. And I completely agree. I have two children um, at university right now. And, you know, I, I think my generation really messed up the world. So it, it, I'm, I'm, I'm hand passing it to everybody, you know, the generations after me to, 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 to try and fix up what we messed up. Um, I was going to say something else, but I think I'm not in present company. Uh, then the other, the other story that I'd like to tell you all is, 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 is one that we learned um, quite early on. And, and it's very tempting to take money from anybody who's looking to offer it to you. Uh, and, and the story is, is that we, we went out and pitched. So this is my first company, not, not, not this current one. We pitched it to a number of individuals um, looking for angel funding, and and one chap in particular seemed very very interested in us and and asked us what our follow on uh, raises were going to look like, and basically turned around to us and said he'll give us all of the money, he'll give us the money for the angel round, and he'll commit to giving us the money in the follow up uh, seed round, and then he'll he'll support us through Series A, and we were talking lots and lots of money here, um, so. As I, as I said, I, I, I've got a wee bit of experience in business, and, and, and generally, when things seem to be good to be too good to be true, it's because they generally are. And it turns out that he was looking to pay for 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 all of this with uh, with illegal money, money that had been gained from 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 illegal nefarious activities, and so we would have benefited from the proceeds of crime, which, as you know, in the UK is a crime in in and of itself. So. It, it was it was while it was tempting and and it certainly turned our heads make sure you do your homework make sure you do your due diligence and look for investors that will bring something to the table with them in an ideal world sometimes you'll just find somebody who wants to who likes your idea and is prepared to to, to underwrite it most of the time you want investors that will bring more than just money to the table. It might be their network, it might be expertise, it might even just be support services. So, so, so that you know they might have a backing organisation behind them, which has got HR and finance and things like that that you can plug into and keep your costs down. But crucially important in my experience for uh, for for you to look for. What, what I would call smart money, money that'll bring, you know, that's more than just the pounds and pence. And then the other one is, is, is look for customers. So customers bring money, but, but look for what I call a reference customer early doors. A customer that, that when you 
put that reality in front of other customers, they'll nod their heads and go, oh, wow, if they're going with it, I respect them. I'd like to go along with that too. Now, that's a lot easier said than done. But I think that that it 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 means that you need to be very, very focused when you're when you're out doing your business development, once you've established all of the things that my pre- the previous speakers were speaking about in terms of developing the company. Um, but yeah, look for reference com- com- uh, reference customers if you possibly can. Time is money. If you're a founder, it's very, very easy to get distracted. Um, and I and I know this from from many, many years of experience. There are always people who want some of your time. They there are always people who think you're nice and smart, and that's very flattering and all of that. So the and the way I learned to do that was was to think about myself as an asset and and to assign myself a value for the various tasks that I was having to do as the founder and CEO of a company. And if some of those tasks could be done as well or better than somebody else at a lower value, then I'd pass that on. And, and, and that's a nice, simple way of deciding what to delegate and what to keep. So if you can pass it off, that's, that's a great idea. The other key tip that I can give is don't rush out and try and build your company's headcount faster than you actually need to. Because you are going to find at some point that the people that you've hired are not actually the shape of person that you wanted, right? It, they, they might not have the skill sets in a year's time or 18 months time that you needed uh, in the longer term. So my advice is wherever possible, and, and not on core stuff, so not on, not, on, not on core and key development stuff, but, but outsource as much as you can. Um, in the first three years, because that'll help you get a very, very good idea of of exactly the shape and roles that you need for your company as you start growing. And then build a formidable team. Um, hire people that are smarter than you as, as much as you can. I, I, I've been very, very fortunate and very lucky that I've been successful in my life. And the secret of my success is that I was always not the smartest guy in the room. I was always the guy that managed to hire people that were way, way, way smarter than me, than, than you. And then in terms of culture, encourage challenge. Um, it's, it's, it's very easy for people to follow a big CEO. What I mean by that, somebody who's got a big personality or is, 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 is a strong influencer. But really do encourage internal challenge. And that once, once you're external again, you're all talking with the same voice, but encourage open challenge. And then for tech startups, and this, this might not be the most popular thing I say this evening, but be prepared if you're a tech uh, founder and, and your strength is technology and innovation in technology, be prepared to hand over the reins of your organization to somebody who is very, very good and very uh, adept in business practices. Um, now, that might be that you hire a very experienced financial director, or it might well be that you're, you, you know, you, you'll always be the founder, but you might not be the CEO. And, and, and do try to put your ego to one side when it comes to, um, to this particular thing, because it's tough. It's, it's, it's very, very difficult to do, but it's essential if you want your business to be as successful as you wanted it to be. And then my last and, and probably most, most important piece of, of uh, advice is just get on with it. There's a big world out there. We need lots and lots of people who think very, very differently about a lot of subjects. And, uh, and, 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 and so for those of you who are starting in on this journey, I hope some of this has been helpful. I've tried to keep it as light as I possibly can, but the very, very best of luck to all of you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Martin. And I apologize. I thought you were going to be talking about your company. But this this was very interesting and very enlightening. And having worked with many entrepreneurs, everything you say is right on target. It's really, really true. Is uh, I've never met one yet that didn't think they had come up with the greatest idea in the world and everyone was going to want it regardless yeah. of what it was it was that's exactly right 
<laughs> Fantastic. Okay, our next speaker is Jonathan Lodge, and we're going to go to farming. <coughs> and he is a founder of City Farm Systems and the AI in Agriculture. Now, I assume that's what you're talking about. Am I correct? <laughs> I write on this one. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I, I hope that's my screen sharing. Good. Yes. Um, yes, good evening or for afternoon for those further west. So I am Jonathan Lodge, founder of City Farm Systems. And I must thank the organisers for the opportunity to speak and to expand on some of the points I raised yesterday. So I grew up in the rural west of England with food so local, our milk probably further travelled further in the cow than in the bottle. And nobody had a clue about the industry that data would become. Um, obviously, my work is based on the need to feed a city's people. With COP26 closing last weekend, we should all know our children are the future and they are lifting climate change and sustainability issues up the agenda rapidly. So my light bulb moment came when I found myself staring at the back of a supermarket truck within sight of its destination store. Ten minutes later, when I finally arrived in store, I found the fresh produce shelves were bare. And I could see the expensive truck was achieving nothing. The produce in the back was losing shelf life and the store was losing sales. So I asked, why do they pay to grow, pack and deliver perishable produce that data can tell us will be wasted? What if we could grow commercial quantities on the large roof but carry little more than the air handling units? Ooh, and for some reason. So, and here's the scale of the difficulties today's students will need to address in their working lives. This slide could easily set the scene for a whole presentation. And we know these are all points of significant focus for future generations. To make a rooftop greenhouse work, we knew insurances and health and safety would make the everyday presence of staff prohibitively expensive. With similar costs to a vertical farm that claims to be sustainable, but struggle to make a profit. So there are a few points here that I will return to. When I talk about data, I often mention a bee. We all know how valuable bees are in nature, but individually, a bee can achieve very little. And the same applies to an individual data point. The fundamental game changer for data was when the memory costs dropped, and rather than a simple card index type database, we could record the time and date, which gives us so much greater value. So bat bees and collectively a swarm of bees can survive a winter, pollinate many acres of flowers and deliver a valuable healthy crop of honey, especially if it's manuka honey. So collectively a swarm of bees has significant value, just like a large data set, which moves directly onto the value of supply chain data. We know that reported sales of manuka honey far exceed known production levels, which means there is significant fraud along complex supply chains which would be prevented if blockchain technologies were adopted. So here we can see the importance of data along the food supply chain. In late September 2017, there were several deaths in America. Several weeks after they banned the sale of all remain lettuce, regardless of where or how they were grown, because they were yet to work out where the E. coli had originated. Even the best quality lettuce grown under cover that doesn't need washing before eating were dumped, putting greater strain on other supplies. Like a car, food is heavily regulated, but the, food, the low sums involved have not yet delivered the same effectiveness. Food supply chains are so complex, the average consumer doesn't care. We are just beginning to see how a similar approach to other sectors can be used to effectively solve these issues. And, with a focus on the net zero carbon, that will have to change. And we at City Farm Systems have a new business model that can achieve that. So like many crops, a lettuce starts with seed sowing and ends some, sometimes several days later with a harvested lettuce in the hands of a consumer, which for most is the only bit they care about. Remembering COP26, we need to equip students to address the issues raised. The costs, carbon, and time involved in our food supplies are obvious to those who know. 
we know cities are at the end of complex linear supply chains with food supplies being heavily reinforced by single use plastics. But the reality of it is, as we can see there, um, it really does cost 127 time, uh, calories to air freight each calorie of a lettuce. And as populations have become increasingly urbanized, food supply chains have become much longer. Many cities and some whole countries rely heavily on food to be flown in. So the costs, carbon and time involved in our food supplies are obvious to those who know. To make progress towards net zero carbon, we need to teach students about every step as a potential point of data failure. We need trained blockchain experts to track progress. To keep it simple here, we can think of each forklift as a breakpoint in data and a point of debt profit taking that never reaches the hardworking farmer. Meanwhile, the lettuce is losing quality and shelf life all along the way. If we replace air freight with a vertical farm, we can see they are not much better. Depending on how they buy their energy, they may claim a smaller carbon footprint, but we should never forget that in a large city, they pay city overheads and still rely on the most expensive final mile, something every student is taught about these days. Ooh, sorry. Then there is a traditional supply chain, which often starts with a commercial glass house that depends on gas boilers. Often they will be running gas boilers all summer simply to create the carbon dioxide their plants need. And if we come back then on to what we offer. So the option I work on, we have the ability to automate and install a greenhouse on a lightweight roof, making a building more efficient and avoiding all the costs of distribution. Here, we use data to change the business model and unlock the benefits that can only be found by growing at the point of need. This offers all the benefits of blockchain without the complexity as we hold all the data from seed all the way through to sale. We can install an automated greenhouse on a non-load bearing surface, such as the roof of a retail warehouse, hotel, office building, or apartment block. In India, they use greenhouses on the roof of office blocks to re reduce fresh air costs by as much as 35%. And we can go a stage further and help reduce scope three emissions by helping to feed the people in the building below. With COP26 just completed, we should remember all intensive indoor growers must add carbon dioxide, which is why they run these gas boilers. So much for global warming. Meanwhile, the end consumers are mostly found living, shopping or working in large buildings where they already pay to dump carbon dioxide at roof level. So in other words, we can offer a carbon consuming supply chain. Many mathematicians are taught about how to present their information. So here is a graphic we use to compare some key performance indicators against others, where we could see the need to avoid increasing costs and make healthy food affordable a key requirement for anyone who wants to address the UN's sustainable development goals. And we're not alone in recognizing the potential of using agriculture in education. Uh, but we can take it to a whole new level. Food is so important to us all, and we realize our low cost, low cost acquisition of data could be used to grow an education with STEM. The need to reconnect urban dwellers with the source of their food has never been greater and recognized by many. And these are some examples. That's a uh, lower left is the uh, a, a rooftop classroom in America. And we've got the outcry for food. A lot of people have been using food banks recently in the UK. And it's all very well saying children have a right to, to food, but we actually need to help them make sure they can grow it for themselves. So, those that taught, saw my talk yesterday will remember these photos. Obviously, food starts with biology and very quickly leads on to many other subjects. And the next slide from yesterday shows elements of a traditional business model and a central starting point for any entrepreneur. However, 
Most business courses teach the importance of principles such as just in time. Again, another slide from yesterday that shows a typical industrial business model, but not one that can deliver our food tomorrow. So we must learn to adapt these principles. We have an organization in the UK called Agrometrics. And what frustrates me about them is that they focus on supply side data and forget that most food waste is found in post-processing and short cycle crops and caused by the disconnect between supply and demand. With many retailers so possessive of their data, it loses significance and value. Strangely, we seem to be alone in looking beyond lean and Six Sigma principles in the food supplies, maybe because our data acquisition is more effective. So if we look at the life of a, of a typical life of a pig and apply some blockchain technologies, we can see it allows full traceability when understood and the coding works, where, which does of course need to reflect data protection regulations. And we can have what one, one colleague on a trip to China called the internet of pigs. Now we can see full traceability and bankers are happy to finance those in the supply chain as they know the parents of the pig, what the farmer fed them, when they'd be ready for slaughter and what their value would be at every step of the way. And we see the similar approach in Italy where much of the fi their famous Parmesan cheese is matured in warehouses owned by banks who know its value, hold it as collateral against loans and ensure it is well cared for. So back to indoor crops and many indoor growers still depend on manual data collection with inevitable delays and greater opportunity for error. Others struggle to add automated data collection to systems that were never designed for it. There is a research farm in the UK with a field that has half a meter of topsoil above a clay base. Being on a slight incline, incline means they have a drainage system that allows them to monitor runoff water every 15 minutes. This data set they collect is highly relevant, consistent, more complex and valuable than that of most indoor growers. With our systems engineered for installation on a lightweight roof, we need to keep track of moving crop trays without human intervention. So we use RFID, which avoids the need for people to work under unpleasant lighting and allows us to unlock many additional benefits with a much simpler way to collect data from three seed through to sale. This means we only need a fraction of the cameras and sensors others need, which simplifies the technology no end. So with our data all but free, we recognize that it offers huge potential in many STEM related subjects. Oops, sorry. Oh, sorry, I've gone, I, my screen has just messed up. Um, anyway, so to help grow an education with STEM, we are working on teaching materials, plans and kits, starting from junior school seed growing, entry level robotics, and all the way up to a fully automated greenhouse that could be installed in the roof of a school. In the field, of research, many find there is a big gap between what works in a lab and out in the real world. I have helped PhD students set up growing trials and witness the manually intensive tasks we can automate. Indeed, we can see a future where some crop research becomes an exercise in mining our increasingly valuable data sets. Or, taking this a stage further, schools and colleges could grow specific crops on a researcher's behalf and learning opportunities for all. We are looking to build a group of delivery partners in several countries who can adapt, uh, adapt to our local requirements and deliver packs of consumables for each semester or to schools in their region. And working on these technologies has won us many awards and I've been asked to contribute to academic books. Unfortunately, I can't show it because my screen has just failed. In the first book on the left, I show how data can be acquired with a fraction of the cameras and sensors needed in a static system. This makes the data far more consistent, consistent, making comparison between cultivars and crop cycles a much simpler task within controlled environment agriculture. And the book on the other side of the screen you can't see in the, uh, uh, is, is a book, my, my, my chapter is titled Feeding a Smart City, where I explore how internationalization has given us more diversity and therefore cultural expectations within our diets. This is a huge environmental problem as we demand food that individual regions have not traditionally delivered efficiently. Many food restrictions promoted by different religions 
originate from concerns about food safety that may not be a risk in other regions. And so that brings me to the end. And so much, so thank you so much for listening. And do please get in touch if you'd like to partner with us in your region. You're on mute, Beverly. You're on mute, Beverly. Thank you. I wanted to thank you. I think that was an excellent presentation. Food is such an important part of our lives. And I'm wondering, Mohammed, is there some way you think your organization could work to, with some of these food ideas? I think, uh, I think it would be exciting to, you know, I, I really like the idea of the be alone and, you know, be together. So, you know, that, that's, 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 uh, that's a massive, uh, you know, explanation. So I think there are plenty of opportunities. So the way we, we can work, any idea on the food uh, technology or any idea on the food uh, space, we can actually, you know, work together to, you know, prototype all those ideas and, you know, probably kind of a food specific incubation space. Or if uh, uh, Mr. Jonathan uh, take, thinks it is better, you know, we can always explore it. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I had a question about food though. One of the things I was thinking that, is it part of us, uh, the fault of the consumers, we have grown so used to wanting certain foods 12 months of the year, all the way around. Bananas, for example. I can't imagine not wanting a banana regardless of the month it was, which really then requires shipping in, of course, from other places. Again, that's part of the internationalization, but of course, we may well have to face a life without bananas very soon. When the Cavendish banana that is predominantly used throughout the world is very much at risk. That's right. Martin, what do you think about entrepreneurship in the, shall I say, food distribution business? I, I honestly, until I'd, I'd heard Jonathan speaking, um, I, I was one of those sinful people who, who, who goes to the supermarket and, and, and expects to find what I, what I want. Um, and it, 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 it's deeply, deeply worrying. I mean, my daughter, for instance, um, is forever ticking me off and telling me that I've got to improve my, my, my purchasing habits and make sure that I only purchase from local producers, et cetera, et cetera. And we are, we're trying. But from an entrepreneurial perspective, um, I think that if we could get small groups of people in different locations buying into this, I think that this is an idea whose time has come. Definitely, definitely, definitely. And 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 I think I think the other thing, I I, I spend a lot of time talking to investors and people that have got very, very deep pockets and and in the last five years, that, that seven years now that I've been an entrepreneur, I think that you'll find that that the investment community is far, far more sympathetic now than it ever has been to the kind of problems that we've been facing globally. And this is right up there as one of the very biggest. That's right. In some cities, they are also taking empty lots or places where they're tearing down buildings and making uh, community gardens of a sort. Does that fit in with what you were talking about there, Jonathan? It's, it's becoming very popular. The problem is it's, it's small back garden type growing in a city, it'll, it'll help. It'll help a lot of understanding, it'll help with education, but it won't really feed the city. And we need to do a lot more. Um, our thinking is that, again, effectively what we're talking about is distributed growing and manage it via the cloud. And you've got that intelligence that actually helps it work. Well, I have to put a note, I've just been reading Darwin's origin of the species. And one of the things that he said is one of the things that happens when you get too many of any species, they start running out of food. And I mean, that was one of his sort of ideas. And of course, I think it's true now is where you have these food deserts around the world.
and places where food is so difficult to get. And we have to be somewhat innovative if we're going to come up with a way to feed the world. Um, any comments you would like to make? And any one who would like to ask a question? We have a couple of minutes left. If we... I think uh, it was uh, it was uh, a very neat, you know, a very representation, which is uh, the need of the hour. Everybody is uh, going back to the basics. Uh, you know, we don't we don't really see. Uh, we don't really think of the scarcity of food and water, which is going to be coming up if we don't get together and work on it. And uh, initiatives like this uh, would definitely uh, help us to explore, you know, better and uh, bigger opportunities. You know, so I would say thank you very much. You know, like uh, Mr. Martin said, we never think of these things because everything is available around us. You know, so yeah, yeah. You know, well, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. Of course, it wasn't in the last year. Um, both Brexit and COVID have highlighted the issues, although That's actually it. there wasn't much of a shortage of food. It was mostly it was in the wrong place and the wrong size mm -hmm. packets. So we need far greater flexibility. And as you mentioned, just in time was become so popular and that we're finding there's some problems with just in time when it can't get there just in time. <laughs> we have ships off the coast of Southern California that can't get into dock. And so a lot of essential parts and essential items are sitting on ships that can't get into ports. Anyone else have a comment? Well, I wanna thank all three presenters and I'm sorry, Martin, for getting the topic wrong on yours, but it was very interesting and I certainly enjoyed it. And I want to thank Hanadi for putting this together. I think day two too. was just a wonderful day, Hanadi. And we thank want to you thank so you. Much. You've done a thank wonderful you. job. Thank okay. You so much. And now it's almost you. midnight in Kuwait. Yes. <laughs> and you can all have a good night's sleep. Thank you so thank much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you for staying awake, Dr. Hanadi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.